Hello and welcome to New Testament Survey Week 2. Today we're going to be talking about Jesus and the Gospels. This is, I believe, the first lecture of three on Jesus, if I recall correctly. Uh, there are four Gospels in the Christian New Testament that talk about the life and teachings of Christ. And we're going to be talking about the backgrounds of these Gospels. The first thing that we're going to that we're going to look at is, are the Jewish sources that refer to Jesus. The most important of these is Flavius Josephus, who lived between 37 and 100 CE, and he wrote several histories of the Jewish people, and specifically one history of Palestine. And in his works, he refers to Jesus twice. One of these references is highly, just high, very, very likely uh, not written by Josephus, but by a Christian apologist, because the works of Josephus were preserved by Christians. The other one is considered authentic. And then we have the Babylonian Talmud. Okay, as for Josephus, he is our source for much of ancient life in Palestine. He's the only historian of Palestine in the first century, so naturally he informs, uh, he informs us of a lot of things that are going on in the New Testament, although he doesn't mention very much about Jesus at all. He is known most for his works called The Wars, The Antiquities, and Against Apion, and for being a Jewish, Jewish apologist to the Romans. Now we know that the Romans persecuted the Jews and considered the Jewish faith to be inferior to the tradition uh, Roman religions. But Josephus, who wanted to be accepted by the Romans and wanted Judaism to appear legitimate, he presented Judaism, or attempted to present Judaism in an apologetic manner, giving reasons for his faith. And I'm sure you've heard before the term Christian apologist, which tried to do the same thing uh, originally. Whenever Rome was around, the Christians tried to demonstrate that they were not a threat to Roman rule and that they could get along just fine with other Romans and they're not, the Christians aren't doing anything strange in their meetings and their theology is sound. Well, Josephus tried to do this with Judaism, and his life is amazing. Uh, you may remember that there's a story in the Gospels about Jesus uh, whenever he was in Galilee one time, they tried to make him king. Well, they did that with Josephus, successfully. They didn't make him king, but they made him a general to fight against Rome in one of their wars. And in a Hollywood type uh, transition, he gained favor with the Romans and lived the life of a, an aristocratic scholar. And in Antiquities, book 18, section 3, paragraph 3, now this would, in a book, it would be referenced 18.3.3. And he says, Jesus, a wise man, and this is almost universally rejected is genuine, and the reason for that we'll get to in just a minute. And then again, in Antiquities, just two chapters later, he says, James, the brother of Jesus, and we know from the Gospels and from early Christian tradition that James was indeed a brother of Jesus. This is almost universally accepted as genuine. There are very good reasons for both. Now this is the first reference that is not genuine. I'll just read it to you. About this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who wrought surprising feats and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by the men of the highest standing among us, 
had condemned him to be crucified. Those who had in the first place come to love him did not cease. On the third day he appeared to them, restored to life. For the prophets of God had prophesied these and myriads of other marvelous things about him. And the tribe of the Christians, so called after him, has still up to now not disappeared. Now this was written at least 30 years after the death of Christ, if it was in Josephus. But this came much later, much after the life of Josephus, obviously written by a Christian who wanted to impose on Josephus these words. Now, they're complicated scholarly arguments in the Greek, but it would be impossible for a Jew of Josephus' standards to write these things about Jesus, especially the line, the very first line, if indeed one might call him a man. And then he openly accepts the miracles of Jesus and the traditional stories of Jesus. You know, Pilate, Pilate for example, uh, being the cause of his death and the resurrection of Christ. People do not think that Josephus would affirm all of these things about Jesus, about Jesus whereas a Christian would. Now this is a second reference that most scholars consider genuine. Since Aeneas was that kind of person, excuse me, and because he perceived an opportunity with Festus, having died and Albinius not yet arrived, he called a meeting of the Sanhedrin and brought James, the brother of Jesus, who was called Messiah, along with some others. He accused them of transgressing the law and handed them over for stoning. Now this is something that we know happened as referenced in the book of Acts. Certain followers of Jesus were brought before the Sanhedrin and stoned. Stephen is the most prominent example in Acts. But this is the kind of thing that a Jew would certainly write about Jesus, giving an account of the death of James. Excuse me, got itchy nose. Okay, now there are also pagan sources that refer to Jesus, or more specifically, to the early Christians. Pliny the Younger, who I, I just love to read his works, he was, this, this, and this was written between 62 and, actually we know it was written, well, I have the date there, uh, this Epistle 96 mentions Christians who worship Christ, but he knew nothing of Jesus. He couldn't tell the difference between Jesus, between Christians, Jesus followers, and Jews. But he knew there was a new religion, and Romans did not like that. They liked only ancient religions. He was the governor of a province of Rome, and he brought in two female slaves that were Christians and tortured them to find the rest of the Christians so he could also put them to death. And the test that he came up with was they were to deny Christ and sacrifice an offering to a pagan god. And he said no Christian could do this. So he knew a little bit about Christianity, but he wrote a, an epistle this epistle 96 he wrote to Trajan to act, to make sure that he was doing the right thing. You know, Trajan being uh, the emperor at the time. And Trajan wrote back and said, yes, you're doing exactly what you need to do. And then a Roman historian, Tacitus, in his Annals 1544, describes the persecution of Christians in Rome. Tacitus, though, did not really know all that much about Jesus. So we need to be careful whenever we address, you know, a lot of people are going to say to you that Jesus is not referred to in anyone 
that wrote about the first century. And for the most part, they're true, they're right, except for the Christian sources. Christianity took a while to get noticed by the Romans, and, and they were historically insignificant at the beginning. They were a small religion that followed a crucified man, and crucifixion is the uh, lowest way to die. There is no uh, glory in Christianity, but eventually, as you know, Christianity gained uh, a lot of momentum as time went by. But Tacitus, going back to this, did not talk about Christians all that much. Suetonius, in his Lives of the Twelve Caesars, talks about the persecutions of the Christians under Nero and the expulsions of the Jews from Rome because of Christus. And Christus is not Christ. It's a different person. But Nero did persecute Christians. Nero had a lot of problems. He wasn't a very balanced emperor. And he set Rome on fire and blamed it on the Christians and used that as a way to brutally persecute Christians. He didn't have that much against Christianity per se, but he needed a scapegoat. Okay, on to the Gospels. First, we're going to talk about the Synoptic Gospels. They appear first in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called the Synoptic Gospels because they're similar. They focus on Jesus' ministry in Galilee, the betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus. Only the feeding of the 5,000 is reported in all four Gospels. And there is a concentration here on the kingdom of God. Okay, just did that. John's Gospel, which appears after Matthew, Mark, and Luke, focuses on Jesus' ministry in Judea, whereas the Synoptics focused on Jesus' ministry in Galilee. He mentions the kingdom of God only once, and his concentration is on who Jesus said he was. For example, the way, the truth, in the life. The literary criticism of the Synoptic Gospels focuses on these points. First of all, the Synoptic problem. This, this Synoptic problem is rooted in the similarities between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There's a whole lot of material that's almost exactly the same between these three Gospels. And the problem is, how on earth did that happen? Which of them came first? And what's the priority? And a lot of scholarship has been written on this. And this is a primary reason why I chose to be a Pauline scholar. I chose to study Paul because I wouldn't have the synoptic problem. I wouldn't have to talk about all of these sources every time I wanted to say something. Almost all of Mark appears in Matthew in shorthand form. And this is all, I mean, when I say almost all, it's like there's 630 something verses in Mark, in all of Mark. And Matthew has all but like eight of them. I mean, it, Matthew has pretty much the whole thing. Half of Mark appears in Luke. And then, Matthew and Luke share about 235 verses. So, there's a... Uh, it's a Gordian knot. It's very, very difficult to undo. Because we have all of these inter interwoven, significantly interwoven strands in between these Gospels. Solutions to the synoptic problem. The old theory is that there's a mark in priority. That is, whenever 
Matthew is is examining, you know, whenever the writer of Matthew was writing, he chose Mark over Luke, where they had the same verses. Now, the second one is, there was an original sayings gospel. That's the famous Q, which is from Quele, which means source. It is not a document. Many people think that there was a Q document, but there's not a document. It's a theoretical sayings gospel that Christians spoke to each other. There's a theory that most of these gospels and most of the writings in the New Testament, with the exception of the Pauline letters, you know, those are letters that Paul actually wrote, but the gospels are actually Christian traditions that were passed on orally before they were written down. Okay, I'm going to go back to this because I want to, uh, I want to talk about this one some more uh, on, on this point too. There was an original saying, Gospel Q, and that means, that's a German, uh, Quelle, for source, and this is, was the original gospel that Christians spoke to one another, and eventually it formed into Mark, and then it was used by Matthew and Luke. It, I'm not going to make you memorize. There's a very famous diagram of how this all happened, you know, with a bunch of arrows and stuff. You don't have to know that, but what you do have to know is that this is one of the solutions to the synoptic problem. It explains why so much of Mark appears in Matthew and Luke. That's all you need to know. Okay, form criticism of the gospel. It asks different questions. It asked about the transmission of the stories. We just talked about how the gospels were originally sayings spoken between Christians in Christian churches used in worship. Now, form criticism asked about the transmission or the passing on of these stories. They first divided up the Gospels into literary units, which are pronouncements, miracle stories, parables, stories about Jesus, the I sayings in John, I am the way, I am the truth, and legends about Jesus and the early church. So I want you to, to know that the Gospels contain these little literary segments you, and you can you can identify them yourself it's not difficult one is a pronouncement and then the miracle story you know you can see where a miracle story begins in the gospel and where the miracle story ends and then the parables and you can and also the uh, translations help you you know they have they'll a lot of times have in bold this is a parable of the prodigal son and then it will tell you when it ends and it begins with another little section so these are very uh, intuitive and very easy to identify then the form critics they interpret these sections within the situation in life in the early church and this the, this word situation in life that phrase is from German sits im Leben which means setting in life you know, German scholars have a tremendous impact on American scholarship. I don't understand it. I had to learn German for it, but the Germans apparently have been leading the way for a very long time. You know, we learned earlier Q, Quelle, and now we have situation in life. And the situation in life is what is going on in the early church? Why did they come up with this? this pronouncement or this miracle story or this parable or how was it being used and so this was a completely new way to understand the New Testament and it started happening in about the 1950s their interest was in practical contexts that produced and transmitted the earlier traditions 
so the sayings that eventually became what's in the in the gospels they're trying to identify the practical context that produced this and preserved it in what made it relevant how did it originate they noticed that the miracle miracles of Jesus are very succinct they're short and they have a very direct point and the teachings are preserved because they answer questions of the church and then there's also the struggle between Jewish and Gentile culture and this is going to be a very important well, this is a very very important point Jewish and and Gentile uh, cultures split very very early in Christianity and Christianity became a very Gentile religion even though they said that it was an extension of Judaism but we created a religion especially Paul he created a religion that separated Jews and Gentiles forever in Christianity so you have Jews mostly Jew, most of the Jews hate Christianity because Christianity has attempted to interpret Jewish prophecy to the exclusion of Jewish heritage. With Christianity, we had an entirely new heritage that sprung up, and it was conducive almost exclusively to Gentile culture. The Gospel of Matthew, part one. The Gospel of Matthew was written to convince Jews that Jesus is their royal Messiah. Like we just said, this was m much more conducive to Gentile thinking than Jewish because they had a completely different idea of what the Messiah would be. And they still have a completely different idea of what the Messiah would be. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, which is where the Messiah is supposed to come from. Jesus has an inaugural address in Matthew, like he, as if he were king. You know, he's the Messiah coming out in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which is about chapters 5 through 8 of Matthew. And his concern, or the author's concern, is primarily on the Jews, as we said, and the lineage of David is is very receives a lot of attention Jesus is recognized by two blind men as a descendant of David by a multitude by the Canaanite woman by the crowds at the triumphal entry when he enters Jerusalem as well as children at the temple there's also an appeal to Jesus as the fulfillment of prophecy like we said Christianity tried to claim Jewish prophecy and interpret Jewish prophecy to the exclusion of Judaism. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus preached in Galilee fulfilling the prophecy. He and he preached in parables. And then there's the Gospel of Mark which most people think was written for Gentiles. Very good reasons that people think this. First of all Matthew, I mean Mark translates Hebrew and Arabic and Aramaic sayings. So Hebrew sayings that Jews should know. He translates them into Greek or Latin so that the reader, the Gentile reader, could understand it. He translates numistic terms into Roman equivalents. Like there are denarii in here. There it's a Roman coin. They don't use the Hebrew coin or the Aramaic coin. He uses the Roman equivalent. And there's a t date and authorship, and uh, I'm going to refer to the timeline on that. There's also a concern in Mark for what Jesus did, not what he said. Now this is really interesting to me because I study philosophy, and many philosophers are important, or the ancient philosophers are important because of how they live their lives and not so much what they did. And so Mark, appealing to Gentiles, follows this pattern. And events rather than discourses are important. Discourses are basically sermons. 
he doesn't care about the sermonizing of Jesus. He cares more about the event, like what Jesus did. And there's an impression of immediacy, and you're going to hear this in Christian sermons if you haven't heard it already. I've preached it myself. Uh, Mark has the word immediately or then an incredible amount of times. It, it's every transition. Immediately Jesus did this. Immediately they went to that. It has a sense of immediacy or pushing forward all the time. Um, I translated Mark for, or memorized Mark in Greek for my Greek exam uh, to pass, to get out of uh, Bright on the PhD level. And I loved it because about half the words were the same thing. They were all immediately. Mark has an emphasis on the humanity of Jesus. Jesus asks questions. I mean, this is just really beautiful. When you, when you think about what happens to Jesus in later tradition where Jesus is God, Jesus asks questions where he, it's apparent that he doesn't know the answer to them. And you, you will notice this whenever you read Mark. This is an emphasis on the human aspect of Jesus. He expresses deep emotion, grief, anger, and amazement. Now this T right here should be way over here, but anyway. He sleeps, he gets exhausted, and he goes to sleep, and he seems to be ignorant of God's plan. He says, I don't know what's going to happen. Only God knows. So he appears as a human, and Jesus um, just makes me weep every time I read Mark. And I have I had to read Mark a lot. Whenever he's betrayed by his disciples and abandoned towards the end of Mark, it makes me cry every time because you can see that, I mean, it's like a good novel, you know, when it comes together and you feel for the characters you know, Jesus is betrayed and abandoned by those that he truly loved. And he invested in them and taught them for three years. And now all of a sudden he's alone. And then he's condemned. And then he's crucified. All alone. Maybe one or two witnesses. But it's so powerful in Mark. It moves me. Okay, but also in Mark, there is an emphasis on the divinity of Jesus. He is mentioned as the Son of God many times. And on to the Gospel of Luke, our third Gospel. It was written for educated Gentiles like Theophilus. Now, both Luke and Acts are dedicated to a Gentile patron. A patron is someone that funds the uh, writing, in this case, of the Gospel. Theophilus provided Luke with the papyri that he needed, the uh, writing utensils, and possibly even a uh, stipend, and he uh, wanted to know the Gospel. So Luke says that he went and researched, and apparently Luke used some pretty good sources. You know, he used the same source that Matthew did, and uh, and Mark. So he even said that he talked to some people that might have been alive, or maybe the second generation of Christians. Now Luke is the most elegant Greek of all the Gospels, and I will say it's still not that great, but it is very good. And by elegant Greek, we mean uh, his grammar. His use of Greek grammar and vocabulary is very good. Most of the other writings in the New Testament use a style of Greek that is uh, very poor whenever it's compared to uh, people like Plutarch and Plato and even possibly uh, Josephus and Philo. Now, I've read a lot of those people and I've read a lot of the New Testament in Greek and uh, I do agree that the Greek New Testament is not very elegant. And 
that's okay. But you just need to know that. Some people think that the New Testament is written in this lofty, uh, eloquent uh, Greek, whenever it's really the Greek of the common person. Common people could understand this stuff for a little while. You know, there, there were uh, Christians who could not understand Koine Greek, which is what this is called. It used to be called Holy Spirit Greek because nobody else used it. But we have found uh, some other papyri now that uh, are pretty close. Excuse me. Um, in the Gospel of Luke, there are a few quotes of the Old Testament, which makes us think that it's written for Gentiles who wouldn't know the Old Testament like Jews do. Luke is the only author who refers to Jesus as master rather than rabbi. Rabbi is the Hebrew term for the teacher. Master is the Greek term. He seldom refers to prophecy, of course, few quotes of the Old Testament. And instead of using the Hebrew word amen, he uses the Greek word truly or verily. You know, I'm sure you remember, verily, verily, I say unto you, uh, from the King James Version. There's an emphasis on Jesus' importance for all races. Now, because of this, a lot of people use Luke as a social gospel. That is, they think that we can, we can use the gospel of Luke to establish a paradigm where all people are equal and we serve each other in common humanity. Luke traces Jesus' lineage to Adam not David or even Abraham. So, quote, all flesh shall see, shall see the salvation of God. Now, if he, if he traced the lineage of Jesus to David or Abraham, he is tracing it back to Jewish lines. That Adam is the first human being before there were Jews, before Father Abraham. So he has a more universal aspect, you know, like that social gospel where um, everyone is included. Now, there are no restrictions of the apostles to the Jews. Now, that means that he, whenever Jesus was teaching his apostles, he did not say, you have to only preach to the Jews. You can preach to the Gentiles, Jews, whoever. But you'll notice in other Gospels that Jesus is sent to the Jews first and then to the Greek second. And women have a prominent place in the followers of Jesus. In Luke, there are women who support Jesus as patronesses. That, that is, women who have access to money and choose to support him. Now, as we said, the Gospel of Luke is used often as a social gospel and the, and the uh, Jesus his humanitarian concern is evident in Luke he has empathy for the poor the oppressed and the outcast his sermon on the plain which is the equivalent of the sermon on the mount only Jesus isn't on a mountain in Luke he's on a plain he ends with be merciful and not be perfect and you can see how being merciful appeals to the crowd, and being perfect only applies to a few. And there are woes to the rich and the powerful. And I'm going to pause this for a second. I'll be back with you shortly. Okay, hopefully I'm not recording over uh, everything I just did, but uh, see if we can back up. Tell you.
Sorry about that. It's Wednesday here at Fort Worth. Uh, later at night, than I'd like to admit. Um, it's the only day that you can water your lawn, so I had to get up and uh, and move my sprinkler around. But anyway, uh, the Gospel of John appears, of course, after Luke, and it's part of the Johannine literature, which includes John and then the three letters of John that appear later in the New Testament. It's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. All of these are written by, if not the same person, written by people that knew each other, called the Johannine School. And they were disciples of John that continued his work, if indeed it's not written by him. And then there's the Apocalypse of John, which is sometimes attributed to the writer of the Gospel of John. Uh, it's also called Revelations. And this work is clearly not written by the same person that wrote the Gospel of John. And uh, maybe you can hear in the background, you can hear the sprinkler uh, hitting the window. Uh, John has a very distinct style that is distinct from the other Gospels. He doesn't use Q like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He doesn't incorporate large portions of Mark like, the, like Luke and Matthew. John is unique. His emphasis is on discourse, on preachings and teachings of Jesus. And he also has a distinct theological interest. And we're going to focus on all three of these. His distinct style in John is simple but profound, has limited vocabulary. Now, this is wonderful for those who, of you who are going to be learning Greek. You're going to be reading John a lot because John writes with very simple grammar and, and vocabulary, yet it's very profound. It's not easy theological material, or not, and it's not shallow. It's just easy to read, which we all can appreciate. And the emphasis on the discourses of Jesus. He is very divergent from the Gospels on chronology and other historical data. Now, some people think that the Bible is uh, perfect in every respect, and they think that all of the chronology has to be the same. That is, if one gospel says Jesus was going to Jerusalem at a certain time, well, we're going to make all the other gospels say that too. Can't do that with John. He's not interested in chronology or a detailed order of history of Jesus. He is more interested in the theological content and meaning of Jesus. So early Christians recognized this and said there are four gospels but John is concerned about theological matters and not so much about the history of Jesus. Okay, and then the second point, the theological interest. We know from John that Jesus and the other disciples were followers of John the Baptist. Okay, this means that even though John had a theological interest, we only know from John this one historical thing about Jesus, that he was a disciple of John the Baptist. And also, some of his disciples came over from uh, the John, John the Baptist camp. And there are also possible independent reports on Jesus' memory, and that is the memory of Jesus. Like, how Jesus is remembered is unique in John. And he might have some other historical value there. But most of his value is a theological reflection. Okay, theological interest. John begins his gospel with theology rather than genealogy. Now, this is very, very critical to note that in John, he begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, and so on and so forth. Now, the other gospels begin with a historical account of Jesus, like his, uh, who his daddy was, who his daddy's daddy was, his daddy's daddy's daddy, all the way back to either David or Adam. 
as we as we saw earlier with Luke. Now, he begins with a theology of Jesus, like who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God, or is God Himself, and and so that is a that's a very clear difference because in Greek rhetoric you always begin with the most important thing that you're going to say and you know you lead off with that you don't wait until the end uh, although the end is also important but you get the idea um, John uh, Jesus represents the life that one can have with God and that isn't that something he is the bread of life, the light of the world, and the resurrection of the life. And the message in John is, if you believe and you keep his commandments, you too can realize this awesome unity with God that Jesus enjoys. Okay, date and authorship of the Gospels. Now, very little can be known about this, and this has given scholars like me fits for 2,000 years. When exactly were the Gospels written? And this is impossible to know. We do know with some certainty that it, it is indeed in the first century. The reason for that is other first century writings reference the Gospels and the letters of Paul. And pretty much the entire, almost the entire New Testament, with the possible exception of Revelation, and maybe uh, Peter and Jude, but the Gospel certainly, and the Epistles of Paul, I know, were referenced by Christian bishops that we know lived between uh, 95 and, and all the way up to certainly 150, whenever Marcion was excommunicated from the church for editing the Gospels. So we know that they were around at about this time. Also, the earliest New Testament papyri, you know, the leafy stuff that they wrote on. The earliest date on one of those is the Gospel of John, which is the latest, one of the latest New Testament documents, and it's dated at 110. So we know that they were around, but we don't know exactly when they were written. Now, every Gospel is anonymous. The Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are traditional designations that scribes wrote on the top of New Testament documents. And I showed you in uh, week one a picture of one of the earliest, manu earliest papyri manuscripts of John. And you could see John clearly, you know, I showed you where that Greek line was, the Gospel according to John and Gospel according to Luke. Those were, were, were scribal traditions. They're written on the top of the Gospels, but we really don't know who wrote exactly who wrote them. And they were given traditional names. You know, they were apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Luke. I mean, Matthew, Mark, and John. Luke wasn't an apostle. But they were all traditional Christian heroes, and that's how they got their names ascribed to them. So we don't know... By simply by their name, that they were that they were written early, or they were written by a disciple of Jesus. And I want you to review on this on this note the early Christian writings timeline in the timelines section of this course. There is a video lecture that accompanies it, and I want you to know pretty much all that stuff up to the third century. That is. I mean the fourth century, that is 325 CE, from the earliest Christian writing, which is about 30 CE to 325. Now, it's not a whole lot of material, uh, even though it's about 300 years, but I want you to be aware of about when all these documents were written and what other documents were written around that time that were excluded from the New Testament. Okay, there are other sources on the life of Christ. The Christian Apocrypha, that is, as I said, books written at about the time of the New Testament that are not included in the New Testament. 
See, the New Testament is the canon, which is canon law, and that comes from Roman Catholic canon law. They accepted 26 books in the New Testament, but there were a lot of other books that were written. And the Christian Apocrypha talks about the life of Christ. So there are other lives of Christ out there that we know about that aren't included in the New Testament. Now there's also later extra biblical sources, studies, stories of Jesus. Ex extra biblical means outside of the Bible. And again, it's a lot like the Apocrypha. This is usually called the Pseudepigrapha. Now, Pseudepigrapha means falsely ascribed writings. This was extremely popular to do in the ancient world. If you really, really liked Plato, you would write a book in the name of Plato or in the name of, Pla of Plato, one of Plato's famous disciples that possibly hadn't written anything. So you can be like, oh, it was discovered, you know, something new. This happens all the time. It happened with the philosophers, it happened with Homer and Virgil and everyone else, and it happened to Christians. So there are some books that claim to be written by Philip or Jesus, or Mary Magdalene, and they were excluded from the New Testament because they were not used in popular Christian worship. They might have been used in Gnostic worship, or a few Christian churches, but the ones that gained popularity and endurance through hundreds of years made it into the New Testament. Now, the lost years of Jesus were especially popular now we know uh, the Gospels cover about from the birth, from Jesus' birth to about when he was 12 years old and they also cover uh, whenever he was 30 to 33. So there are infancy Gospels, a whole lot of them, that describe Jesus whenever he, whenever he was a child and all the way, all the way up to they try to fill the gap at the 30-year mark. So that's something that you will see a lot of if you start talking about the New Testament. Okay, now we get to the summary of the life of Christ. This is what appears in the Gospels. We have his birth. That everybody knows the Nativity story. There's John the Baptist, who was baptizing people whenever Jesus was an adult, and Jesus was one of his disciples. He was baptized by him, and then Jesus went off and did his own thing, taking some of John the Baptist's disciples. There's a baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, and immediately after that, the temptation of Jesus, which is when Jesus was driven out into the desert, and, and the gospel says that he was tempted with three different temptations uh, by Satan. And then there's a public ministry of, Sa of Jesus, which is uh, my personal favorite of uh, the life of Christ. Whenever Jesus is uh, going about the countryside healing people and preaching good sermons and raising people from the dead and just being, being just an awesome guy. And then there's the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Okay, John the Baptist, who I referred to in the previous slide, he lived in the wilderness, and he was widely popular. And by wilderness, we don't mean, um, I don't think it was uh, luscious trees like we see in, in Massachusetts. You know, th this was the desert, and he was immensely popular. It says in the, in the Gospels that people came from all around and listened to John the Baptist and were baptized by him. Now, the curious thing about John the Baptist, among other things, is that he did a one-time baptism, not a daily baptism, like the washings of the Pharisees and the Essenes. He did a one-time baptism for repentance of sins in preparation for the Messiah to come and preach the good news. He also preached, this was the content of his preaching, 
He preached that the day of Jehovah was at hand, which is the day of the Lord, when the Lord would come and judge uh, all human beings. So it was time to repent. And this would be the end of the suffering of the Jews. So it was a very positive, good news message. But people had to repent, and that's what people did not want to hear. <clears throat> okay, the baptism of Jesus. As I said many times, he was a disciple of John the Baptist. Uh, don't let that bother you. It just means that he was friends with his cousin and loved to uh, listen to God's word whenever John was preaching. He was baptized by John and supported the message of repentance and the coming of the kingdom of God. And so we ask the question, why was Jesus baptized if he was the Messiah? Well, it was in obedience to God, and it also, it also serves as a starting point for his ministry. Jesus kicked, or God chose to kick off Jesus' ministry with his baptism, and that's how most Christians start out their ministry, too. Whenever you first believe in Jesus, in many Christian churches, uh, you receive the baptism, and that begins your Christian ministry. Okay, the temptations of Jesus, as referred to earlier, he was, excuse me, I turn on the camera and my nose itches. I don't know what I don't know what the deal is. Um, in the temptation stories of Jesus, it happens immediately after his baptism, and there's three temptations by Satan. One is the temptation of bread. One is the temple, and one is the kingdoms. Um, all of these appeal to different aspects of being Messiah. The he tempted Jesus to turn the bread into, I mean, turn, turn stones into bread, and he tempted him to throw himself off of the temple, and he tempted him by offering him all of the kingdoms of the world if he just bows down and worships. All of these three aspects directly relate to who Jesus is as the Messiah and his ability to withstand these three temptations demonstrates you know, to the reader or is supposed to demonstrate to us that he is the Messiah. There, okay. The public ministry of Jesus is divided into three categories by Metzger. The year of obscurity, the year of public favor, and the year of opposition. Now these three should be extremely easy to remember because they are very um, self-descriptive. Jesus was obscure, then he had public favor, and then he was opposed. Let's talk about that. And the year of public favor is when he, after his year of obscurity, I decided not to do a slide on that because uh, the year of obscurity is the first year of his ministry and we don't know anything about it. It's a year of obscurity where we know very little about it. He was just gathering followers that first year, which I really, really like. And then the second year is a year of public favor. This is when He's going around the countryside healing people. He's preaching the good news. He's teaching his disciples, and he's harassing religious leaders. Now, these are my favorite things about Jesus. I love the healing stories because there is no way to replicate it. You know, imagine someone receiving their sight after being blind for their whole life. You cannot replicate that. No actor can pretend to be blind and then see. It's something that when you see it and you just imagine the joy on a person's face that I mean it gives me it gives me goosebumps. We can't replicate that. You know, I just imagine Jesus going through these towns, you know, healing someone of leprosy or they have a limp and their leg is made whole. I wish I could see that with my own eyes, but just imagining it, it, it's just, it's just, it's almost beyond me. It's, it's just 
Wow. Wow. Uh, and Jesus is preaching the good news. The kingdom of God is coming. Now, a lot of Christians today don't have a good news. You know, we're preaching doom and gloom. And you're going to go to hell if you don't do this or that. But whenever Jesus was preaching, it was a message of good news, the positive message, that God is going to make everything new again, and everything whole. And if you believe in God, or if you believe in me, believe in Jesus, then you'll have this eternal life where you can drink from the well that never goes dry. Because God is coming, and he's going to work wonderful things in our lives. That's the good news that he taught his disciples. He's told his disciples to teach that. And he harassed religious leaders. This is another thing to love about Jesus, is that he challenged the religious leaders of his day much more than he did the poor, or, or the outcast, or even the people he healed. He just healed them and said, sin no more. But for the Pharisees, he tried to correct their, their backward thinking. And this made him a very unpopular guy. Which leads to the year of opposition. He increased his harassment of religious leaders in the third year of his ministry. He was no longer timid. He knew that his time was about to come. And Jesus pressured even more the religious leaders of his day. He openly rejected the elaborations of the law of Moses. That is, the things that the Pharisees added, the traditions that they added, if you remember from last week. They believed not only in Scripture, but also in the traditional interpretations of Scripture. And we do that today as Christians. You know, we have the Bible but we've stacked on hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years of tradition on top of it, so much so that it's almost impossible, even for the scholar, to find and discover what was originally said and what it originally meant, because so much stuff has been added to it. And Jesus rejected that kind of thing. Jesus rejected their teachings concerning the Sabbath. You know, the Pharisees were extremely uh, intolerant of anything that went on during the Sabbath. They even measured how many steps a man could take before he broke the Sabbath. And Jesus is saying, no, the Sabbath belongs to men. You know, it was made for people to rest and worship God. It wasn't made for us to put all of these extra rules on it and, and basically persecute each other because somebody else doesn't follow the Sabbath the way we do. And the final week is called the Passion Week. Jesus entered into Jerusalem, and he entered in in triumph, and then he left on a cross. And that all happened within a week. The first day was the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, where he rode on the back of a donkey, and people uh, threw down their their cloaks on the ground and their clothes so that the donkey's feet wouldn't touch the ground. He entered like a king, and people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, and recognizing him as the Messiah, which the Pharisees took as blasphemy and he cleansed the temple during this week you know you, you probably heard it's the only time Jesus was violent uh, which is perhaps the exception of the fig tree whenever he cursed the fig tree that was a tree this was people you know in, in around Jerusalem people came from everywhere you know all the surrounding provinces and countries where Jews were they would come to the temple to worship God, and part of that, an integral part of that, was animal sacrifice. And so these travelers, the traveling Jews that came to Jerusalem, had to convert their money into uh, the money that they were using at the temple, and they also had to, uh, you know, buy their sacrifice. 
So there's a lot of money changing going on. And there was a lot of corruption. You know, people were trading, you know, making uh, this exchange uh, in a way that was uh, ex exploiting the travelers and even people that lived uh, close by. And Jesus was completely disgusted by this and upset the tables and drove all the, drove all the people away with, a, with a, uh, a whip that was used for animals. You know, I don't think that he hurt anyone. It would be against his character completely. But this is seen as a, a pretty violent act. You know, he's forcefully uh, disrupting the uh, goings-on at the temple that had been happening and, uh, you know, his entire life. So why would he do it now? Well, this is last week. This is why a lot of people think Jesus was crucified. You know, he was a relatively unknown person. You know, he was out in the countryside. And whenever he came to Jerusalem, he upset the temple. And that's what made the uh, powers that be upset with him. Even Rome would get upset with him for that because the Romans as we said last week, they wanted people to give their, their taxes without rebelling against them because they wanted to use their provinces for as long as possible. And if there are rebellions or upsets of the peace on this level, that will get their attention and they nip it in the bud. And that's what they did, some people think, that's what they did with Jesus. He did some public teaching and his final engagement with Jewish leaders. This is when he predicted the destruction of the temple. Now this is very important because there is a uh, wide disagreement in people that talk about this as to if this was a prophecy that Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple or that this came after the destruction of the temple that was in 70. If you care about this kind of thing, it's just something you have to decide. Um, Jesus, uh, I mean Jesus, Judas Iscariot plots to betray Jesus. And then we have the famous Last Supper scene where Jesus is like this. And he gives the bread to his 12 disciples who were on his left and his right. And that is the Passover meal. And then we have the prayer in the Mount of Olives, where Jesus prays that God take this cup from him, and he cries his tears of blood. And then we have the arrest, trial, and crucifixion during this last two days. And th this is what moves me. Jesus, uh, Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. It's supposed to be a sign of friendship and welcome but instead Judas uses it to signal the enemies of Jesus to come and take him by force there's a trial before Caiaphas at night which was illegal and there was the uh, where Caiaphas says are you the son of the blessed and, he sa and Jesus says I am and then we have Peter's famous denial on this night, where he denies Jesus three times. And then there's the trial before Pilate, and Barabbas, a murderer, is released, so Jesus is uh, kept and crucified. They could have let Jesus go, but it says that they cried out for Jesus to be crucified, that is, a crowd of Jews. Now, this is where Christianity can become extremely anti-Semitic, which, which means extremely against the Jews. Now, the Romans killed him. He was a Jew, Jesus. He was betrayed by his people. That's what the Gospels say. But there's no reason to use this in a way that is hateful, because Jesus died for peace. Jesus is scourged with a whip. It rips off most of the skin on his back and legs. 
Somehow, he managed to carry his crossbeam to Golgotha. One of the things that's very important to note here is that Jesus, the, the Romans were extremely good at crucifixion. They did it all the time. If you're crucified by the Romans, you're going to die. And if you're, they know how to squirt, scourge you or whip you to one inch of your life, the, the people that did that were professionals, and they uh, did it so that he had just enough life in him to die miserably on the cross. It's the ultimate form of Roman torture. Now, another component of the Gospels in this last week is the resurrection and ascension. And this is where we end, so this is happy. The death of Jesus was the death of hope. This means that for the earliest Christians, the ones that followed Jesus during the time whenever he was having his public ministry and whenever he was crucified, there was no reason for them to think that anything that he said was true. You know, they had this glorious year of um, public favor where Jesus was going around and preaching and teaching and, and being the Son of God. And now, instead of driving out the Romans instead of becoming a great military leader he was betrayed by his own and that, that is Judas betrayed by his own disciple and crucified like a common scum common criminal early Christians I'm skipping, skipping to this last point here early Christians really truly believe this and we go back to the idea of all those miracles whenever Jesus gives a blind man his sight people in ancient times knew what blindness was and they knew what it meant for someone to see they also knew what a broken arm was or a limp or leprosy or even, even epilepsy, demon possession. They knew what that was, and Jesus healed that. They knew that Jesus died. They know what death is, and they know what resurrection is. This is a very serious business that is too often dismissed. They really believed it. That says something. They believed it together. The resurrection, even if it didn't happen, would be very inspirational. An inspirational story of where all hope is lost, Jesus appears to his disciples again and teaches them for 50 days and then ascends. He's taken up into heaven, according to the gospel. That's an inspirational story in itself. But people really did believe it. And this is what gave Christianity all of its power in the early days and today the resurrection is the heart of the Christian faith and that's the end thank you for watching and I hope you were in, encouraged by it and you learned a lot please let me know if you have any questions and remember I can't see myself when I'm giving these lectures so if I'm acting, if I'm moving around too much, uh, I can offer you a separate video without my beautiful face. And uh, until next time, thank you. <laughs>